As Steve has said, this is an important meeting, welcoming two Labour councillors, ex Labour ex Labour <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, into our coalition. And as, as Steve has indicated, it is a coalition involving different organisations. Of course, the most important organisation is the RMT, Transport Workers Union, which at its conference last week voted unanimously to continue its participation and backing of Tusk, which was a big achievement. It was the first conference, of course, since the, the tragic death of Bob Crow and Wiggy Go, and, and let's be blunt about it, there are members of the Labour Party still in the RMT, but in fact, even members of the Labour Party stood up and spoke in that debate and said, yes, actually, sometimes Labour needs to kick in, and perhaps Bet Tusk is the best way to do that. So that's very encouraging that it was a unanimous vote, including Labour Party members voted in that conference to continue their backing of Tusk. Um, and that, that, you know, the RMT is the main components, but it includes the Socialist Party, the Socialist Workers' Party, the Independent Socialist Network, which is independent members of TUSK uh, um, as organisations, and then in an individual capacity, the Secretary of the, uh, the, 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 and the Assistant General Secretary of the Prison Office Association, the Assistant General Secretary and the Vice President of the PCS Civil Service Union, um, uh, Executive Committee Member of the Fire Brigades Union, ex-president of the NUT and, 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 you know, and various trade unionists there who at this stage haven't been able to get the unions to officially come on board TUSK but are, um, are organising and arguing the case and e even to the extent that the UNITE conference again which took place last week uh, a resolution was moved there um, to, you know, uh, uh, to commit UNITE to organising the conference to discuss how to make sure the working class has a political voice, given that Labour has abandoned the working class. And even though the leadership spoke against it, and they attacked Tusk when they spoke against it, um, uh, uh, over a quarter of the delegates at the United still voted for that resolution at that conference, which shows that the arguments are on our side, and as events develop, they will grow stronger and stronger. But really what I want to deal with tonight is this issue, because you know, with the two councillors uh, uh, coming on board at tonight's meeting, we do need to address the issue, what can councils do to resist the cuts? What can councillors do to resist the cuts? Because, as I understand it, the comrades in uh, Leicester are proposing the idea of a, a people's budget to be moved by uh, Wayne and Barbara at the, uh, the budget-making meeting next February, March, a conference in the autumn, inviting community groups, trade unions, uh, 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 um, uh, 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 anti-Belgium tax activists and so on to come together to you know, draw up what they think is needed for the people, the, the working class people of Leicester and that then will, will, will be presented in the council chamber in the budget making process next year but I can guarantee you the main argument will be from the Labour Party there is nothing we can do. Our hands are tied um, the government um, uh, uh, allocates uh, uh, grants to councils and councils are completely powerless to resist the instructions of the condemned government to attack public services. And the first point that we have to make is that um, there are actually enormous powers that councils still have. It's not true to say, for example, that councils could not, for example, um, uh, pass a policy refusing to evict people would fall into arrears for the pension tax. Um, it's not true to say, in fact actually there are up and down uh, the country about 30 out of 320 English council authorities, um, uh, sorry local authorities, that are still um, not charging uh, or, or maintaining full council tax benefit for those who um, have had council tax benefits and that was introduced in the 1990s, but that was obviously abolished by the, uh, the coalition for 2013 and the majority of councils uh, voted to pass on um, that charge to people who hadn't previously paid the council tax, but 30 uh, didn't do so, so it shows it can be done. Actually, we drew up a list um, on the Tusk Steering Committee and published it on the, on the website, um, you know, so again, comrades can check that out, but there are <coughs> examples of councils using their powers in ways that benefits ordinary working class people, like Tower Hamlets, for example, 
um, has, has introduced its own education maintenance allowance. I mean, it's uh, an executive mayor, and he's called it the MEA, the Mayor's Education Award, because you know, obviously he wants to uh, have some prestige for that. But nonetheless, it shows what can be done. Councils have powers. It's also true to say that he's cut other services in order to pay for that. But it shows again that councils can actually have an impact on people's lives. Sure Start Centres. Um, over 500 Sure Start uh, Centres have uh, been closed since 2010 and uh, a, a childcare um, you know, provision has been removed from the, from the bulk of those that remain open. But still the case in 550 um, Sure Start Centres, there is still childcare provision. It shows what can be done. Services can be um, um, saved. Some councils have started again council uh, house building. Some councils have introduced, uh, actually only three, but have introduced Unison <coughs> Um, ethical care charter um, to end 15 minute maximum visiting slots for home care workers, to end zero hour contracts which 60% of home care workers are on, and to pay for, uh, um, you know, for travel time rather than having that, that unpaid uh, you know, you know, uh, care workers in effect having to pay for their travel between uh, and their different homes that they visit. Only three have implemented that charter but it shows it can be done. But the problem with all of those, and those are just a glimpse of some of the powers that councils have to resist the cuts if they chose to do so. The problem with those examples actually is that while one or two councils have at least implemented one or two of those policies, there isn't one council that's implemented all of them. It you know, included, for example, county you know, setting up the register of landlords which you could then use to implement rent controls. Uh, we're refusing to uh, outsource to companies that blacklist uh, uh, trade unionists. Um, uh, uh, the idea of introducing free school meals for every primary school pupil. Three councils have done that in the country. Um, and Blackpool's introduced free breakfast for primary school pupils. But again, no council, no one council has done all of these. Uh, it's actually 11 uh, policies that we identified of, of councils' powers to affect public services. And the issue that it will come back to is funding. That it's impossible for, uh, you know, for us to implement these type of policies because of the funding restrictions. Now we want to, the idea of a people's budget is to create um, a, a, a dialogue with, with groups, you know, to have campaigns around those type of issues, and I'm sure there's you know, plenty of cuts that you can you know, uh, you know, refer to in Leicester which we could pull into an alternative budget. But the issue is, what do you do when you come up against the, you know, the issue of um, the crisis of council funding? And we have to acknowledge there is a crisis in local government funding. Of all the government departments that have faced austerity, um, the average cut in departmental uh, budgets in the last four years has been 11%. For local councils, <coughs> it's been 27%. So there has actually been a massive 7 billion cut in, a, a funding, in central government funding <coughs> for local councils. That has uh, uh, clearly put services at risk. But it is possible to resist that. It's possible for those cuts not to be passed in. Councillors have the choice, and that's the message we have to uh, 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 keep on stressing. And the best way of doing that, and this is the, the core policies, this is what TUSC stands for in terms of our, our basic position. Um, it's, it, you know, it's ten demands, actually, that we make on our council candidates. You can't be a TUSC council candidate unless you sign up to these demands. <coughs> we will oppose all cuts to council job services paying conditions. Reject the claim that some cuts are necessary. No divide and rule in that sense. Refuse to implement the bedroom tax. Refuse to um, uh, uh, you know, support privatisation of services. Refuse to vote for council tax increases to compensate for government cuts. But the most important one of all, actually, is, for vote, is to vote. You, if you're elected as a Tusk councillor, you go into the council and you vote for councils to refuse to implement the council. That's the bottom line of what it means to be a Tusk councillor. And we say we will support councils which in the first instance use their reserves and prudential borrowing powers to avoid making cuts, but Tusk argues that the best way to mobilise the mass campaign that is necessary to defeat the dismantling of council services is to set a budget that meets the needs of the local community and demands that the government makes up the shortfall. Now, is that policy practical? Is it a realistic approach to take, you know, we're asking Barbara and, and, and Wayne to take into the council chamber in, uh, in eight months' uh, time? That's, what, you know, that's really what I want to try and address um, tonight. Because 
it has been done historically. Um, the obvious example is the Liverpool Road, the uh, yeah, Liverpool Council in the 1980s, but it was done in many ways by the popular councils, Labour councillors in the 1920s, by the Clay Cross councillors in the 1970s. But Liverpool perhaps is the most uh, recent and modern example. And it was, that was the way the council presented their um, campaign. And they did win. They won, in 1984 money, £60 million from central government by refusing to, you know, you know, to implement a cuts budget, proposing in effect a needs budget, which included the building, for example, of 5,000 council homes, more homes built in the three years of Liverpool City Council from 84 to 87, and the entire, and then were built by councils for the entire 13 years of a new Labour government, which is incredible if you think about it, but that's a fact. <laughs> But they did, and they put that forward, and they demanded from the Tory government, from Thatcher, a slightly stronger figure, you think, than Cameron and the, and the coalition government, but they demanded from Thatcher the money, and they got 60, they won 60 million pounds to finance that. But of course, that has created an enormous backlash from the right wing in the Labour Party, the gently the mythology. Today, I guarantee you, the argument would be, uh, you know, Wayne and Barbara want to bring Liverpool to, you know, to Leicester. They want to create chaos in the city. They want to you know, create a, a, you know, a, a disruption and so on. Um, and they want to bankrupt the city. That would be the argument. That would be the argument that would be thrown out. It's impossible to do it. And, the, and arguments were used. They would be, you know, the councillors face jail if they do this. They face commissioners being sent in. There would be surcharge and so on. Now, there isn't time tonight to go into all those arguments. But the first and most important thing to say is that, um, well, first of all, actually, the councils were not surcharged in Liverpool <coughs> for setting a deficit budget or a needs budget. That actually wasn't uh, uh, you know, um, the reason that they were taken to court eventually. After three years, let's be blunt, but it didn't happen straight away. They passed a needs budget in 1984. It wasn't until 1987 that they were eventually removed from office. But they were actually removed from office because in 1985, in the second year, in agreement with, unfortunately, with Ken Livingston, uh, um, uh, um, David Blunkett, leader of Sheffield Council, Margaret Hodge, leader of Islington, Graham Stringer, leader of Manchester, all now new Labour MPs, um, at that stage, those MPs, who were then council leaders, said, well, look, actually, we're not sure about setting a deficit budget or a needs budget. Let's just not set a race at all. That was the policy that they agreed on, and Liverpool councillors and Lambeth councillors didn't agree with that, but they did accept it, went along with that common front. Unfortunately, all the others went away, leaving Liverpool and Lambeth on their own, and because they didn't set any budget at all, that actually was um, you know, used by uh, the law courts to say they willfully stopped the council receiving income from its rates for a period of, of six months, and, and it was that grounds that were surcharged on. So we're not saying to councillors, don't set a budget, we're saying set a needs budget. Set a budget that meets the needs of the people of the city and demand the government makes, the short, makes up the shortfall. But it's also wrong in relation to the legal position because the law has changed since the 1980s and the Local Government Act of 2000 abolished the power of surcharge except for personal gain. So if there's corruption proved, then uh, councils can be surcharged for the corrupt practices. But that's the only basis. They can't be surcharged for defending services and for setting them in these budgets. Um, and that's, um, it, you know, so the legal position today is that councils have to set a balanced budget. When they're elected, they sign a, um, a form saying they were required by the Members' mode, the, the Code of Conduct. And that Members' Code of Conduct, uh, Conduct says you have to take the advice of the senior finance officer. And I guarantee you, when the People's Budget in Leicester is presented to the, the finance officers, they will say, this is unbalanced. Even if we include in it, as I, I'll explain in a second, about <coughs> using borrowing powers, using some of the reserves and so on, they will say, well, yes, that's true, but it's, it's unadvisable, it's unprudential, it's not, it's not sound financing, it doesn't take into account what's going to happen in the year 2026 or something. You know, so that's the way they, that, that they will argue the case. Um, and they won't give authorisation. They won't, uh, and they will issue a section 25 notice saying this budget doesn't really meet the needs of a prudential, you know, the requirements of a prudential budget. Um, but councillors can defy their finance officer. What happens if they defy their finance officer? Well first of all, um, they can, if the whole council was to do it, um, they could be um, referred to the thing, called, the thing called the standards board. 
Um, and uh, which uh, I don't know how it sort of breaks in Leicester. I think you know, there's now a local standard board. I know in Lewisham, where I uh, work closely with councillors who went for that process in Southampton. In Southampton, the standards board included a retired magistrate, an ex-admiral, and you know, a, a vicar, of course, you know, a, a dig local dignitaries on the standards board, and they would, you know, the councillors have to go before that board and explain what their case was. Well, first of all, that's a hearing, that's an appeal. That means that we can mobilise. If you presented a budget, a people's budget, which, which does which saves the youth services, stops the attacks on adult social care, stops, allows people to you know, be, you know, be eligible for social care you know, before they reach so-called critical needs, which, which means, incidentally, that at the moment most councils now don't give adults, don't guarantee adult social care um, to, you know, to people who can't change their clothes for 24 hours, for example. Yeah, you because know, you know, that's not defined as critical enough uh, you know, and, and social care needs. So if you're presenting the budget which doesn't, you know, chances all those issues and, and really does meet the needs of the people, then you can go before that, you know, that um, standards committee and, and put the case why you've done it. Yeah. You know, so the first thing is you'll have a right of appeal, um, you know, before the standards boards. But potentially, it's true to say a standards board can issue a notice saying that a councillor has breached. Um, you know, their code of conduct and you're debar you can be debarred from, from office for five years. So it's possible that at the end of that process of demonstrations, lobbies of the standard board and so on, that councillors will be debarred, but that means there's a by-election. And if you've, if, if you've built the campaign, then you've got people already, you've got the second 11 up to stand, and, and, and it doesn't actually resolve the issue at all. It means that the campaign continues. In other words, once again, it's a clash of living forces um, you know, which is why uh, the idea of mobilising, we say the best way is a needs budget because it does, it, mo it involves people right from the start. It says to youth uh, groups, do you want to keep youth services going in Leicester? Do you want an educational maintenance allowance for Leicester, locally at EMA? Do you want uh, uh, you know, to have uh, you know, these are the facilities that we are fighting for to keep leisure centres open and so on, to keep libraries open and so on. If you do, then come and join us when we present our people's budgets and come and join us on the process and battles that we will have to undertake in order to you know, to fight for that, for, you know, um, you know, to meet the needs of the city of the people of, 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 of Leicester. Now, it is true to say there are other. Um, angles that we will have to go through and we will have to and I think everybody here needs to be an expert that's why I'm disappointed I only bought 10 copies of the Southampton budget because the Southampton councillors went through this they actually had to draw up a, a budget which included for example um, saving the swimming pool in their ward which you know was the key issue which got them expelled from Labour Party and they voted against <coughs> that um, and the only way they could do that was to actually um, it, you know include uh, um, extra spending on it, 1.5 million in order to refurbish it, because you needed refurbishment in order to be able to, be able to keep, you know, pass health and safety to keep open, so that's one of the factors involved in that. And they argued how that could be financed through borrowing. And then they listed, um, as you'll see by going through the list, they listed um, adult social care services, young people's services, um, uh, uh, you know, it, um, and they discussed this certainly with the unions as well. Um, and, and, there were, and sometimes in, in council budget documents you're going to get things like replacing the software and that's counted as a cut and obviously no one's going to vote against the cut to, you know, to replace the software or something like that. You know, um, uh, uh, although sometimes you do, sometimes the new software is you know, a waste of money. But nonetheless, uh, um, it, you know, uh, but again it's creating that dialogue with the union to say well this is a real cut, this affects terms and conditions and we don't support this, then, you know, then we put that in the people's budget. But in Southampton they went through that and of the 22 uh, million per worth of cuts the Labour Group was proposing, they identified, I think it was 19 million which were cuts, you know, there was you know, there was some which were reorganisations which were, weren't actually cutting services and some which the unions had actually agreed to and signed off on. Um, you know, so they moved that as an alternative budget and they explained how the council could borrow money, use its reserves to finance that borrowing and, um, uh, and not make a, a cuts budget, but also not have an illegal budget or, or, or an unbalanced budget, rather, not an illegal budget, an unbalanced budget. Now, the, the situation in Southampton was, was that it's a solid Labour majority, and while the officers said to the councillors, well, this is actually not uh, a prudential budget, we don't recommend it, it was up to the councillors to vote on it. They have the power to vote on it. 
that they'll give you. Let nobody say to you that councillors don't have a choice. They have the power to vote on it, but the Labour uh, chair of the council ruled that he wouldn't take it as a legitimate amendment because you know, of the officer's advice. That was challenged by Keith and Don, but of course they lost the vote. And you know, the Liberals, the Tories and Labour voted not to even accept it. In Lewisham, a bit earlier, 2008, um, the two uh, socialist councillors there moved an alternative budget with the same type of procedures. Because the, it was a hung council at that stage, Labour had the executive mayor, but they didn't have a majority in the council chamber, and ironically, they were the Tory chair of the council. The Tory chair of the council was more sympathetic to actually taking it, so he allowed a debate. So, um, uh, at, you know, it couldn't be ruled illegal. The, you know, the, you know, the finance, chief finance officer said he, you know, she wouldn't recommend it, she said it was unprudential, she said that you know, it didn't take into account where the savings would come from in, in four or five years' time. By the way, our answer to that was, uh, in Southampton, when Keith uh, uh, Merrill stood up and moved his alternative budget in Southampton, well, uh, uh, in four or five years' time, hopefully there'll be a Labour government. You're a Labour majority council, why can't you get a pledge from Ed Balls now, or Hilary Benn, who's the local government minister, shadow minister, that if we need to borrow to keep youth services open in Southampton, they will underwrite it. And I was talking to you know, uh, 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 Wayne and Barbara earlier, I, I didn't realise Liz Kendall was the, one of the MPs for Leicester. She's in charge of, um, uh, you know, she's a shadow minister for um, uh, 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 elements of public health, including adult social care. Again, that's a crisis that we face in local councils. If Leicester was to borrow money um, or use it, exhaust its reserves in order not to implement the cuts, why can't Liz Kendall give a pledge that if uh, Labour gets into number 10 uh, in, uh, in next May, they will replenish those reserves, they will uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, underwrite the borrowing that a council makes to avoid cuts now. Now we know they're not going to do that. Unfortunately, there's still thousands of people out there who don't, aren't t t t are totally aware of that, as you saw from that debate at the United Conference and so on. So we need to use these arguments to expose and explain again and again. Councils have a choice and Labour has a choice. That's the most important thing. Because I tell you now, if 10, 20 councils across the country, Birmingham City Council, Leicester Council, Nottingham, uh, you know, London Council's under Labour control, if they all said, we're not going to implement these cuts, we're going to borrow, use our borrowing powers, uh, 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 um, you know, not to implement these cuts and demand that, that that's paid, uh, and, those, and that borrowing is underwritten by an incoming Labour government, there would be no cuts. You know, no council was, it, 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 you know, would implement cuts under those circumstances because your government wouldn't be able to move and, uh, 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 and incidentally that would also prepare the grounds for sweeping away the condemned government as well. But the reality is, is that we know Labour is not going to do that. That's why um, we still have to go through those arguments, but we have to keep stressing again and again, councillors have a choice. They don't have to be just mere puppets of Westminster. They can uh, uh, vote to resist the cuts. They have, you know, we have to go through those arguments. It does mean actually some detail. It means, it means going through some of these points about councillors' potential borrowing powers and so on. But the reality is, is that councillors do have a choice. And, if, uh, and we should be arguing for that in the trade unions. We should be arguing for that in our community groups. The process, the idea that the Commons have had in Leicester of a people's budget, I think is a, is a very good idea. Um, that allows us as a campaigning tool between now and February, the next eight months, to really you know, spread the idea of, of resistance to the cuts in practical terms. It, it, it means that people hopefully can come forward in that process and stand as candidates across the city. We would like to see, from that the Tusk Steering Committee, is hoping to see a thousand Tusk candidates in next year's local elections. We, we stood 560 in this year's local elections. We're looking for a thousand across the city. That means in a place like Leicester, there needs to be an anti-cuts councillor, at least one candidate rather in every ward across the city. A challenge for the mayor and so on. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, because we need to see, like, send the message that if count, Labour councillors won't fight the cuts, either stand aside and make way for somebody who will or we'll come for you because we'll stand against you in the, in the elections next year. Okay.